our scripture readings this morning, we have two of them. The first is 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And we have a gospel reading this morning from Matthew chapter 13. Will you stand if you are able for the reading of our gospel this morning? That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes like a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. As I begin this morning, let us have a brief prayer. Most holy and gracious God, we come here together from many places, many cultures, with much on our mind, much upon our hearts. And Lord, this morning we pray for stillness, We pray for focus. We pray that our hearts would be opened, that our ears would be opened to hear your words to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I love our education theme for the year, God's Garden of Wonders, because it reminds me of going to my grandparents' house when I was a boy. Uh, I loved going to my grandparents' house. We lived in Atlanta at the time, and they did as well. They actually lived in the same house for something like 40 or 50 years. And behind the house, my grandmother had this incredible garden sprawling all throughout behind the house. The size and the diversity of this garden was just extraordinary. I know some of you have have gardens um, in the back of your house. And to this day, this is the most magnificent garden that I have seen in a residential setting. Unfortunately, after my grandfather passed away and she sold the house, that massive sprawling garden got turned into a a handful of homes, uh, large homes on small lots. But I can still remember that garden. And my, my first image of my grandmother is that of Gardner spending hours upon hours working hard to cultivate something beautiful. I think that's a wonderful image for God, for us, is God working tirelessly within us and with all of creation to cultivate something beautiful. You know, after my first sermon here about a month ago, someone made the comment to me in a positive way, you seem to really like history, because I referred to history in my, uh, pre- my earlier sermon. Now, I hadn't really considered how frequently I use history in sermons, but in, in all honesty, it was, by far from my, it was far from my favorite subject in school. But I guess that when you're a young preacher without much personal history, <laughs> that you can draw upon the library of human history as you seek stories that will illustrate uh, the message for us. And there are really some amazing stories in history. And so as we begin this morning, I will ask you to take a step back in time with me in the history of our country. In 1876, the United States celebrated the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And one of the ways they celebrated this was hosting a world fair in Philadelphia. They called it the Centennial Exposition, and they invited the entire world to attend It lasted six months, and during that time, over 10 million people came at some point to Philadelphia to participate in this exposition. And during this was during a time period before international travel was as easy as, as it is today, before communications technology was what it is today. And this was an opportunity. These world fairs, they hosted them on occasion, They actually still host them today. They were opportunities for nations to showcase their goods, uh, to foster trade because they might have something that other nations might be interested in and they could come and they could show their goods and then create a market in other areas of the world for these goods. 
It was also a critical stage for scientists and inventors who might have made a new discovery or created a new thing that might be uh, of great benefit to humankind. And at these world fairs, they could share this with millions of people. This was before internet, before television, even before radio. This was actually only about 15 years after uh, Samuel Morse's telegraph had replaced the Pony Express by finally making its way across the country. And 15 years after that. So there was communication in these days was very, very difficult. So it's safe to say it was not easy to get the word out about new technologies and inventions. So these world fairs were big stages, important stages for inventors and scientists. And this centennial exposition is famous for one piece of technology in particular, because it was here that a young, at that time broke, inventor by the name of Alexander Graham Bell introduced an early crude version of the telephone. The thing is, he almost missed his opportunity. He was stuck, his, his little spot at the exposition with this, was this small table in the corner between a staircase and a wall. And people were not really making their way to go see him in that corner spot in this little bitty table uh, for this very suspect invention. And the only way for something to get public attention at this exposition was for the team of judges and reporters that kind of roamed around and looked at the various items that were on display to make their way there, to give it a positive review, and then get the word out. For six weeks, they completely ignored Alexander Graham Bell and his telephone. Finally, one day, they agreed to come and see this invention. But by the time they got to his table, it was hot. It was a late Sunday afternoon in June. They were tired. They were sick of seeing all the things they had seen that day. They were hungry. They just didn't care. So they got to his table. They didn't even test to see if it worked. They just kind of looked at it, picked it up, made fun of it, laughed at him, and then started to walk away. It was actually at this moment that Dom Pedro, who was the emperor of Brazil at the time, walked into the room. He had a previous relationship with Bell and was excited to see Bell. So he walked into the room and said, Professor Bell, I am delighted to see you. He walked over to the table, was fascinated by this telephone. And so he picked up the receiver and put it to his ear. At this point, Alexander Graham Bell walked across the room. He had strung a wire between the, the telephone where the receiver was and the one where the mouthpiece was. And he strung up the wire, so he walked across the room, picked up the mouthpiece, and spoke into the telephone. Don Pedro, when he heard Bell's voice coming through the receiver, shouted, My God, it talks! <laughs> At this point, the judges and the reporters uh, changed their tune. They were fascinated by this device. They came over and decided that this advice they had previously ignored and derided was the best thing they had ever seen. He actually won a prize that year at the exposition. And this was an important, pivotal moment in human history when the tel telephone that almost received absolutely no consideration became this widely publicized, uh, accoladed invention. And 138 years later, we carry these in our pockets. I don't have mine in my pocket right now because it only takes one time of a phone going off during a sermon for you to learn that lesson. But we carry these in our pockets or in our purses, and we would probably agree that this was a fairly significant moment in human history. And it'd be hard to top the telephone as an item of significance at the exposition, but there was another uh, exhibition that was very important, I'll say, to us today. The, the representatives from Japan wanted to create a garden in the Japanese pavilion that would showcase some of their native plants. And so they brought over a handful of plants from Japan, and one of the plants they brought with them was this incredibly fast-growing vine that turned out to be useful for both the control of erosion and livestock grazing. It's the first time this vine had ever been seen in the United States, and so, rightly so, it created a little bit of a stir. The Japanese called it kuzu. We call it kudzu. We are very familiar here in the South with the word kudzu. If you have recently relocated to the South, we affectionately or non-affectionately refer to it as the vine that ate the South. 
Because if you're driving down the road, you might see on the side of the road this green leafy vine that's covered up literally everything, not just the ground, but trees. I mean, there's these lumps that just at once, one point in time were trees. That is kudzu. And kudzu, uh, it, it is hard to get rid of kudzu. It grows about a foot per day in the summer, and no matter how hard you try, I mean, you are hard-pressed to get rid of kudzu, as many of you know. If you mow it, it comes back. If you burn it, it comes back. Even herbicides aren't always effective with kudzu, and the older the vine is, the harder it is to eradicate. So usually people just try to control it. And actually, my alma mater, Davidson College, hired a small army of goats to come and eat the kudzu that was overgrowing their cross-country trails. And so this is a, a, now a widespread practice that we're finding that people are hiring goats to come and eat their kudzu. I mention all of this about kudzu because our gospel reading this morning is about the parable of the mustard seed. Now often when we talk about this parable, we talk about how amazing it is that this tiny seed could become this large plant because truly the black mustard plant can grow about eight feet tall. However, Jesus' comparison of the mustard seed to the kingdom of God goes a little bit further than that. There's a little bit more shock value here for his audience. You see, the mustard plant is a peculiar choice for comparison to the kingdom of God. Pliny, the elder, was a scientist and a philosopher in the first century in the Roman Empire. And he wrote an encyclopedia of the natural world. And this was written about 50 years after Jesus spoke this parable and around the same time that the Gospels were put to paper. And here's what he said, here's what Pliny said about the mustard plant. Mustard, which with its pungent taste and fiery effect, is extremely beneficial for the health. It grows entirely wild, though it is improved by being transplanted. But on the other hand, when it has once been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it as the seed, when it falls, germinates at once. So basically, Pliny is telling the people, don't plant this in your garden unless you are prepared for it to completely take over, because it will take over. You will have a mustard garden. So basically, the mustard plant is Jesus' version of kudzu. That's a pretty strange comparison, I'd say, to the kingdom of God. We often think about religion as bringing order and predictability to our world and our lives. We think about the church as this tame and structured institution, kind of like my grandmother's carefully cultivated garden. Well, my friends, that is not the picture that Jesus paints in this parable. He compares it to the Roman Empire version of kudzu, and as any southerner can tell you, there's nothing orderly or tame about kudzu. It is not, we, the kingdom of God is not a tamed and ordered garden, it's like kudzu. And if the church is going to participate in what God is doing, then we too must be like kudzu. This is a day in the life of our church, as you've seen, when we celebrate those people who have dedicated themselves to the education of our children. Today we honor the commitment of teachers and administrators in our local schools who make tremendous sacrifices and work hard to help our children grow into well-educated global citizens. And so to those of you here today who have dedicated yourselves to this work, we are extremely grateful. Today we also honor those people within our churches that give their time and energy so our kids and adults might grow in their knowledge of God, of scripture, of what it means to be a part of the church community. And so to all of you who have dedicated yourself to the growth of our children and adults, we are extremely grateful and appreciative for your passion and commitment. So it's kind of an interesting day on which to talk about weeds and kudzu as we celebrate these wonderful people among us. Jesus' command and this might kind of upset, uh, some of you might be gardeners and might uh, be, have committed yourselves to eradicating the weeds in your gardens, but Jesus' command to us this morning is to be weeds, to be weeds and to grow weeds. Jesus is telling us to not worry about perfectly manicured lawns, trimmed hedges, orderly color-coordinated flower beds. He's telling us to scatter seeds all over the place, to be messy, to be like kids who got a hold of finger paint. In this parable, Jesus is calling us to be people and to grow people who mess up order and structure. 
He's calling us to be people and to grow people who challenge the status quo and defy expectations. He's calling us to be people and to grow people who take their cue from kudzu, who ignore all obstacles and limits as we seek to spread the love, the hope, the peace, and the justice of the kingdom of God. Jesus is calling us to be weeds and to grow weeds. Some of you may have seen the 1982 film Gandhi. It tells the story of Mahatma Gandhi and the struggle for Indian independence from British rule. Gandhi calls his philosophy of nonviolent resistance Satyagraha, which means literally truth force. The followers of his movement called themselves Satyagrahis. One of the most poignant scenes from the film is the Salt March. If you've seen the film, you probably remember this scene when the Satyagrahis march on the salt works, and they're doing this in opposition to British rule, the British had a monopoly on salt production and levied high taxes on salt, which is a very vital and important thing, particularly in an area of the world like India where you sweat uh, profusely and you need to replenish that salt within your body. And, but believing in nonviolence, as the Satyagrahis marched on the salt works, they didn't lift a hand against the soldiers. But the soldiers under British command proceeded to beat again and again the Satyagrahis. This event received a tremendous amount of international attention. It prompted backlash against the British. The nonviolence of the Satyagrahis contrasted with the violence of the soldiers. It forced people to question the systems and the structures that would allow for this kind of injustice. The Satyagrahis effectively pulled the curtains back and forced the world to see the truth of the situation. Their movement spread rapidly. They were persistent. They challenged the status quo. So in short, they were weeds. And this is the great paradox of the kingdom of God, that good does not come from the expected places, but from the unexpected. That God works through weeds to bring forth life and wholeness. So the question for us, the church, is how are we, the church, called to be weeds and to grow weeds? In what places of our community do people need the hope, the justice, the peace, and the love of the kingdom of God? In what areas of the church do we need to consider how structure and order might be challenged so that the kingdom of God might grow? Pastor Mike spent the past sermon series talking about what it means to be a Christian, particularly in the Methodist tradition. The founder of our Methodist movement, John Wesley, was a weed. He recognized issues within the Church of England, and along with his brother Charles and a handful of friends, sought to bring forth new life by challenging the status quo. And ultimately, this led to the formation of the Methodist Church. In America, the Methodist Church spread not because it followed the rules, but because it challenged them. It exploded in early America. If you've studied early Methodism, I mean, it just exploded. And it's because the the preachers were always pushing out towards new places because they spread the kingdom of God, which meant hope and opportunities for women, for minorities, and those of lower uh, socioeconomic levels during a time period in which that was not the the case. They didn't have as many opportunities. John Wesley was a weed himself who cultivated other weeds. This has been in our DNA for a long time as Methodist Christians. We are weeds that cultivate other weeds. We don't sit safely where we are. We're always looking to where we're going, the next place to which God is calling us. I've been here for about two months now, And one of the most exciting parts of my job is getting to work with the young adult group. As a young adult myself, as many of you can tell, I can tell you it is a rare thing to be in a Methodist church that has such a strong, solid group of young adults. Many churches in our tradition are struggling to connect with my generation, and it's a testament to the passion and the vision of this congregation. In the young adult group that meets on Wednesday nights, we've been discussing a book of parables written by Peter Rollins, a fairly young Irish theologian. We read a parable a couple of weeks ago that was kind of a different spin on Jesus' command 
during the Sermon on the Mount, you, you might remember it, when a Roman soldier asks you to carry, or commands you really, to carry his pack for one mile, Jesus tells uh, the community, his audience, to carry it for two. Peter Rollins puts a different spin on this, and in his version of the story, he tells of Jesus giving the command to the community. This community takes the parable to heart, and the people really commit to the task. In fact, they start to build relationships with some of these soldiers. It becomes a hallmark of this community. They're proud of their faithfulness to Jesus' command. Jesus hears about their work and comes to visit them sometime later. And they tell him of how faithful they've been to this command to go for two miles. How, and they're excited to see what he will say next. And at this point, Jesus gets up, looks out over them, and says to them, Dear brothers and sisters, you are faithful and honest, but I have come to you with a second message, for you failed to understand the first. Your law says go for two miles. My law says go for three. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be weeds and to grow weeds. Weeds are constantly spreading, growing, pushing out, pushing against structures, order, and anything that would inhibit their growth. As soon as we feel like we've reached the fullness of God's calling upon our lives and upon our church, as soon as we stop pushing, challenging, and growing, then we are no longer weeds. It's only by continuing to grow, continuing to follow Christ, continuing to spread the truth and hope of God's kingdom that we live into the fullness of God's calling upon our lives. So as the church, let us be weeds. Let us not be content merely with where we've been or where we are, but let us look always towards where God is calling us, towards the fulfillment of God's messy, beautiful vision for the world in which all people find life and wholeness in Christ. And let us grow weeds. Let us teach our children to do likewise so that future generations might participate in God's gracious work within creation. Will you join with me in prayer? Most holy and gracious God, we pray that you would inspire us this morning. We want to be weeds. Inspire us, sustain us, that we might go forth and share your kingdom, share truth, love, justice, and wholeness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.